A uh, very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for this, uh, I suppose, final session for 2021 of the SK Dharmalingam Lecture Series. Um, this is uh, Dr. Murali, and I'll be moderating this session this evening. And uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and, and it's lovely to see uh, so many of you are taking time to join us on this evening. And if you haven't had a dinner or so, I'm hoping this will kind of stimulate your appetite. And if you have, then uh, this will be, I think, a sweet dessert to sit down to as you get a cup of coffee. Um, so um, with us this evening is a very special uh, individual. Um, I'd like to welcome on behalf of I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Arun is a consultant urologist at um, with the Ministry of Health in the Hospital Serdang, and is going to speak issues this evening and uh, into urology. And as as we we begin the session, I always kind of like to ask our invited guest speaker. Good evening, Doctor. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the pleasure is mine, Dr. Murali. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to present uh, here uh, on, a, on a keynote uh, signature lecture. Um, I hope your team and yourself will continue to give hope and to celebrate life. And uh, we, I'm very, very uh, fortunate and I'm very touched actually to be join the ranks of esteemed predecessors before me who presented a uh, series here. And uh, I hope to have a comprehensive and informative uh, presentation today. But uh, uh, more, more, more than anything, it should be enjoyable. Being the last uh, lecture of the year, uh, I think um, I shouldn't say it, but uh, I hope you were not saving the best for the last. Uh, and uh, everyone is already having some Zoom fatigue because of uh, the one year having uh, lectures virtually. So I hope that um, this will be actually a nice uh, end to the year uh, for everyone. Absolutely, doctor. So, and, and usually uh, nowadays it's, it's kind of um, as we speak to some of our colleagues, some of them are still um, quite junior, they're looking at things to specialize into. I always like to kind of ask the question of, uh, doc, how did you come into urology? Why urology? How has it been? Uh, it's a very specific field. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long and arduous journey that I had. Uh, it wasn't easy. Lots of hardships faced. Uh, I knew from uh, quite early in my medical career that it was a surgical uh, related specialty that I want to do. And uh, it was actually a process of um, rather picking what uh, suited uh, the best at that time. So when you narrow down to what you feel in the surgical specialties that you enjoy, I think I sort of narrowed it down to urology being um, one of the top uh, specialties. So I pursued it and uh, fortunately, uh, God willing, I'm here. Right. Uh, lovely, doctor. And um, um, just just a curious question. What is the kind of interesting thing that, that makes you come out and practice urology every day? Um, I think uh, the opportunity to heal people. And uh, we need to make sure that uh, all communities of life, uh, all walks of life are touched in a way. I, I really want to uh, give uh, the, the skill that I've learned uh, in order to actually make it happen. We have to have uh, to give it back to the community in some way. Uh, I enjoy surgery and I think that's uh, what keeps me going. So there's always uh, adrenaline. Uh, there's always a little bit of a rush. And I think that's all good uh, in the practice. Lovely, lovely doctor. Thank you so much. So without further, further ado, please allow me to turn over the, the screen uh, to you, doctor, as you take us through uh, some and provide us some insight into the world of, um, especially in renal cancer. Thank you very much. Um, I, I thought before we uh, start, I want to just have a, a sort of an appetizer or a, a question or a poll, rather, to just gauge what the audience um, is here today. So the question is uh, for everyone, 
do you treat patients with renal cancer? So it's a, it's a yes or a no question. Uh, just have a few seconds for everyone to answer. It just helps me gauge uh, where you are from and what you do. Okay, so we have um, about 30 who have responded. Um, and um, I'll just give you another five more seconds to respond, and then I'll share the results. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to share the results here. Um, it's quite interesting that um, only about three uh, are basically involved in some treatment of patients with renal cancer. Uh, and majority have not much experience with it. So that was the icebreaker question. Uh, and um, I think I'll just uh, get my screen shared now and uh, probably just move on to the start the lecture for today. If uh, you all could see the screen clearly. So we're going to keep it renal today. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit on the evolution in uh, the surgical management and also the treatment. And uh, our topic would also segue into discussing the current uh, management options in advanced cancer and some of the novel agents, which I call the game changers, and also some of the challenges in the future direction and a little bit on the um, future perspective and uh, management of renal cancer later. So, uh, we have to touch on a bit of history uh, of nephrectomies. Um, Hendrik van uh, Roonhuizen uh, published the first outcomes of unilateral nephrectomies in animals. Um, and nothing was uh, to note about the contralateral hypertrophy of the remaining kidney. He actually noted that. And um, not to note about the survival of these um, nephrectomy um, people. Next came the Joseph Nicholas uh, Comhair who performed experimental unilateral nephrectomies on 65 dogs, and out of which 63 had died, and two survived. So um, RSPCA wasn't very strong at that point, and therefore um, he got away. However, the outcome wasn't very good. William Morton and James Simpson uh, developed anesthesia in 1840, and uh, Louis Pasteur, of course, was uh, very instrumental in the germ uh, theory. Uh, and finally, Joseph Lister uh, discovered asepsis and antibiotics. So anesthesia and antisepsis, uh, antisepsis allowed abdominal surgeries to progress. Ovariotomies, uh, which is actually cystectomies, by pioneering surgeons like Charles Clay, Thomas Spencer Wells, and Thomas Keith and Edmund a Peasley lay the foundation for nephrectomies. And probably some of you have guessed it right that uh, nephrectomies were actually um, removed by or done by mistake. So the first kidney operations were actually done by mistake. Spencer Wells, I uh, still use the forceps uh, during surgery, unexpectedly found a healthy kidney in the tissue he excised with uh, an ovarian cyst. So in the uh, 19th century, William Hingston performed the first planned human nephrectomy in 1868 in a hotel. And unfortunately, uh, upon removal, the patient died on table. Uh, Gustav Simon uh, performed a nephrectomy under chloroform anesthesia, and the excess was via a lumbar incision. And the operation took about 40 minutes to establish a blood loss of 50 mils, which is very good. Uh, but the patient suffered some post-operative wound complications and had to be in hospital for about 28 days and was discharged two months later. Then came Carl Johann Langenbach, who excised the first malignant tumor, uh, followed by Emil Cocker in, 18, in the 1870s, who utilized a subcostal incision to access the kidney transperitoneally and commented upon the benefit of being able to palpate the contralateral kidney to better review its quality. Spencer Wells uh, redeemed himself a little by doing a partial nephrectomy 
and uh, for perirenal lipomas. So fast forwarding about 100 years or so, what do we have now? We have uh, in 1991, uh, Ralph Clayman performed uh, the first laparoscopic nephrectomy on an 85 year old woman for an incidental uh, renal mass, which turned out to be an oncocytoma, it's a non-malignant tumor. Uh, and uh, Howard Winifil went on to do the first laparoscopic partial nephrectomy and uh, Bertrand Guillon New actually carried on the first robotic assisted nephrectomy in 2001 in Paris for a hydronephrotic end-stage renal failure patient with uh, PUG obstruction. So we've actually come quite a long way. In 122 years, we have uh, from the days of Gustave Simon, who did a 40 minutes uh, procedure and the patient um, in bed for 28 days and discharged after two months. Um, uh, Dr. Clayman actually, uh, though took about seven hours for a laparoscopic operation, the patient, patient was discharged in day six. And things have actually evolved and are much better these days. I'd just like to share a milestone and a very proud moment for Serdang Hospital and also Malaysia, where uh, in 2019, two years ago, um, my team and I, uh, with a multidisciplinary team, also removed the largest reported renal tumor uh, in the world, actually, by dimension uh, that was actually reported. And um, furthermore, uh, last year, uh, we went on to do uh, a very large tumor of more than 20 centimeters, uh, did it uh, via a single port laparoscopic uh, transperitoneal approach. And uh, this was also uh, one of its kind uh, in this modern era. So let's touch a little bit on epidemiology, the classification and some prognostic factors of uh, renal cell cancer. So renal cell cancer um, is reported to have uh, the incidence of about 400,000 new cases per year with 170,000 deaths. So we can see that North America has the most uh, number and uh, males uh, predominate with a ratio of about uh, two to one. And uh, this is probably seen uh, across the world as well, where the male and to female ratio is more. Then um, the uh, uh, incidence of cases amongst uh, the patients who have uh, high income earners in the Asia Pacific and Northern American region uh, is actually a lot more compared to the Sub-Sahara, uh, Central Sub-Sahara and also the Southern Sub-Sahara region. So the incidence of renal cancer actually is regional based uh, over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, this is the incidence and prevalence of cancers in Malaysia and renal ca uh, cancers or kidney cancers actually sits uh, in about the 10th to the 15th position uh, depending on the gender. So we note that the kidney cancer is actually uh, of about 1,009 uh, cases that, that was reported in the year uh, 2020. And uh, this is followed by uh, bladder cancer. So the most, um, uh, this is about number 10 at the moment in the Malaysian statistics. So the annual incidence of course uh, is 2.1%, um, uh, which is um, actually uh, uh, two to one ratio that you see in the population in Malaysia. And uh, this is definitely increasing from year 2017 of where we had 872 cases, now it's risen to about 1,009 cases in 2020. So there's increased detection in cases. It could be attributed to the various conditions and clinical use of imaging because most of these cancers are actually found incidentally. So what are these prognostic factors uh, that are involved? Tumor grade, uh, the histologic grade is an independent factor correlating with survival. Uh, multiple systems are used to grade renal cancers in which the Furman's grade is the most widely used. The tumor necrosis, a histologic coagulative tumor necrosis, is an independent predictor of the outcome of clear cell and chromophobe uh, renal cancers. And it should routinely be reported usually in the specimen as well. It is also part of several integrated staging systems, which uh, is, uh, consists of stage, size, grade, and necrosis that we call the s sign score. And uh, now coming to uh, the TNM staging, which is uh, tumor nodes and metastasis, we notice that uh, it's, um, when it's organ confined, the five-year survival rate is better compared to 
when the disease is a T3 or a T4 when it's spread outside the kidney. And the uh, survival rate actually diminishes tremendously after uh, the tumor becomes advanced. Ferments and also the uh, International Society of Pathology, Urological Pathologists have actually come up with some grading to also classify five-year survival rates based on the grade of the tumor. So tumors were defined as having inconspicuous absent nucleoli at uh, 400 magnification. For, the, uh, for some of the tumors, when you have a visible uh, 400 magnification uh, or 100 magnification, these are called the grade three tumors. And finally, when your tumors are visible at 100 magnification, uh, these are called uh, grade four tumors where they have bizarre, often multilobulated um, uh, nucleoli. And also grade four tumors can show extreme nuclear pleomorphism, clumping, uh, chromatin, or also sarcomatoid and rhabdo rhabdoid differentiation. So the five-year survival drops tremendously as the grades increase. So the histologic subtype uh, carries prognostic significance. Uh, clear cell carcinomas, which are typically have a deletion of the chromosome 3P, arise from the proximal tubule. And macroscopically, they have um, solid or less common cystic. Uh, they occur sporadically. Uh, clear cell carcinomas are specifically associated with a disease called the Juan Hippel-Lindau disease, which is um, a VHL gene that is found on chromosome 3 and plays a pivotal role in the development of uh, clear cell renal cancers in patients with VHL disease and sporadic RCCs. So uh, sarcomatoid differentiation can occur in these uh, de-differentiated tumors and papillary RCCs actually account for about 15% of the kidney cancers and it can be divided into type 1 and type 2 subtypes. It's based on the histologic features. So papillary RCCs originate from the proximal tubule, but these tumors are morphologically and genetically distinct malignancies. Although type 1 lesions occur in patients with hereditary papillary cancers, the majority of these are sporadic. Type 2 papillary cancers are frequently associated with aggressive course and advance stage at presentation and is associated with a poorer prognosis. There's something called a fumarate hydratase, FH uh, deficit, which is uh, by molecular alteration in the FH gene, and they are either sporadic due to somatic or inherited germline mutations. The chromophobe uh, carcinomas are histologically uh, composed of sheets of cells that are darker and uh, clear cell carcinoma. They lack the abundant lipid and glycogen that is uh, characteristic of most RCCs and originate from the intercalated cells of the collecting system. So renal oncocytomas are, are very rare. They're uncommon. They are purely oncocytes with large, well-differentiated neoplastic cells, which intensely, with intensely eosinophilic granular uh, cytoplasm that is due to a large number of mitochondria. Uh, like chromophobe carcinomas, oncocytomas appear to be uh, intercalated cells also originating from the collecting ducts. Early reported metastatic oncocytomas probably represent chromophobe RCCs as well. So there are other variants and subtypes like the translocational um, renal cell carcinomas and uh, collecting duct tumors that are not as common as uh, this one's mentioned here. So there are numerous, um, uh, what do you call that, molecular biomarkers and um, these biomarkers are very useful in that they uh, have, uh, though they are used these days, there's not much clear indication as to whether they are actually beneficial or not. Uh, they are carbonic anhydrase uh, markers. Uh, these markers are potentially associated with worse prognosis for patients with clear cell uh, RCCs, uh, like the KI67 and the mutation at the 3P21 uh, also sometimes uh, the use of uh, CRPs. So the prognostic models are divided actually into two, where the localized RCCs and the metastatic RCCs have different, different prognostic models. Uh, the UISS is actually from California. The S sign 
the Karakowitz nomogram, all deal with localized uh, renal cancer to have um, you prognosticate how they will do. And metastatic RCCs have two very uh, uh, important prognostic models, the MSKCC and also the Hanks model, which is also known as the IMDC, where uh, Dr. Hang is actually one of the authors. So um, why I mentioned one slide here on the con contrast enhanced CT is because the ability to obtain a high resolution quantitative assessment of uh, enhancement using Hounsfield units, uh, which can be done with a CT, but it cannot be done with all the other modalities. CT scans are the mainstay of um, imaging. Uh, they can tell you venous involvement, what the vascular supply is like, the contralateral kidney, what it looks like, lymph nodes, adrenal glands, and also give a renal score that we will talk about in a short while. So uh, this is a non-enhanced uh, CT scan uh, uh, where we see the, the top uh, A, and uh, basically it's detecting calcifications, fat in the tumor, fat stranding as seen uh, in inflammation. Then you have uh, B, uh, the small letter B, where uh, the second phase is done uh, in maximum of 30 seconds after the patient is given some contrast. It is called the corticomodulary differentiation, where the renal cortex and arterial structures reach a peak enhancement and the cortex and medulla are minimally or maximally, sorry, um, differentiated, particularly important when a partial nephrectomy is planned. And then comes C, which is the nephrographic phase, which is 70 to 100 seconds after the contrast is given. And this provides the best depiction of a renal mass, which typically uh, do not enhance on to the same degree as a renal parenchyma. And then finally, uh, I didn't have it here, which is the delayed phase. And that occurs from about six minutes uh, to about 10 to 15 minutes. Now let's move on to the surgical aspects. So the surgical aspects are basically um, dealing with uh, this, what we mentioned uh, was the renal score. So the treatment of a localized renal carcinoma remains overly subjective. So the renal, which is an nephrometric score, quantifies the salient characteristics of a renal mass anatomy. And uh, the treatment patterns of a solid renal mass uh, can be quantifiable based on the anatomic features using nephrometry to be evaluated. So what we do is uh, not one part of the treatment decision making uh, is uh, involved here. There are a few uh, steps uh, that are seen and the nephrometry aids in objectifying the previous subjective material uh, matter. So we have uh, the uh, tumor in centimeters, whether it's exophytic or endophytic, the nearness of the tumor to the collecting system, uh, whether the tumor is anterior or posterior and where it's located uh, compared to the polar lines. And this tumor is actually given a score. The bigger the score, the more complex uh, it would be to operate on. So nephrectomy. Over the years, nephrectomy has actually evolved from what it used to be. Uh, it was a open procedure that was done. There are various ways to do incisions from a midline incision to uh, what we call a chevron incision. Here, a chevron incision, um, depending on which side the tumor is, and um, a chevron with a midline extension as shown in C, which is also called a Mercedes-Benz sign or a Mercedes-Benz incision for some uh, for tumors that need excess, uh, which are sitting higher up. We need a, a thoracoabdominal incision. A common flank incision is done for cancers that are in the retroperitoneum. And uh, a chevron incision with a midline stenotomy for uh, cable involvement or a thrombus involving the cable. And of course, bigger uh, operations uh, for the thoracoabdominal midline extension as the one we showed that was done in Serdang uh, two years ago for the, one of the largest tumors that we actually removed. So uh, we can also have a midline with a sternotomy and a midline abdominal uh, with a small parasternal incision. So uh, we, we know that uh, nephrectomies can be done via various methods. Um, we can do it flank, subcostal, thoracoabdominal, 
and also not to mention it can be done open uh, via um, uh, the robot which is the new uh, kid on the block and also or not so new kid on the block rather and also laparoscopically so minimally invasive and um, open procedures Just get the video to play in a short while for you. Uh... So uh, it's just shown here, the basic principles of approaching the kidney tumor is first by to ligate the artery. The renal artery is ligated with using um, uh, clips. And this is a safe clip that is actually used uh, to on the side of where the uh, artery is left behind. And then we ligate in the middle uh, with this um, uh, uh, scissors. Similarly, after that, uh, the renal vein is ligated. And same thing, the polymer clip is used uh, with a lock engagement feature. And uh, then uh, it is also cut. Finally, uh, the ureter uh, will be ligated. Similarly, with uh, the clips as well placed on either end. Usually, when the tumor now doesn't involve the adrenal gland, uh, it is the adrenal gland is actually spared. Uh, so uh, it's actually good to have the adrenals um, preserved for patients if uh, the tumor is not involving the adrenal gland. As shown here. The specimen can be actually delivered via an endo bag or an endo pouch, uh, depending on uh, how the uh, tumor is done and how the operation is done. Of course, if it's open, then it's uh, just removed uh, from the operating field, depending on the mode. The principle, of course, is the same, whether it is uh, done robotically, laparoscopically, or via an open procedure. So this is actually a very good slide in that uh, it tells you uh, about inadvertent injuries that occur. Now, uh, the surveillance for uh, patients are done. This is uh, we're talking about small renal masses. Small renal masses actually constitute uh, tumors that are four centimeters or less. And um, the surveillance is actually done based on how the tumor progresses. Now, Patients actually may, will, uh, may be willing not to have surgery done for them. So there are protocols to actually do imaging at regular intervals to make sure that they do not progress. And um, if they are, do progress, there's some intervention that is done. This is a short video on small renal masses. And small renal masses, as I mentioned, constitute something of, of four centimeters uh, or less. And these tumors actually uh, are size of a golf ball, to be honest. They can be at any part of the kidney. And uh, usually the 20 to 30% can be benign. So the counseling is quite important. And we know that uh, some of these tumors actually behave, uh, they have patterns to show that they are benign uh, features. So in these tumors, uh, you know that women are actually less uh, susceptible or they are less predisposed to having these tumors and therefore they harbor more of a benign character. Uh, tumors that are two centimeters or less basically uh, have 1% chance of actually it being mal malignant, three centimeters, one to 2% of chance and if it's uh, four centimeters, they have a five to 10% chance. So, so it depends on what the size of the tumor is, then we can postulate whether we need to do an active surveillance for this patient, or we need to do something uh, more invasive. So the management of renal tumors basically uh, is, can be divided into surgical removal, freezing or burning, uh, preservation of the kidney. So we talk about freezing or burning, it is actually uh, dealing with uh, cryoablation techniques and also um, of uh, the RFA. Surveillance is something that we need to discuss with these patients quite, uh, quite extensively on how they want to uh, progress.
So active surveillance um, can be uh, done with uh, the use of CT scans and some, in some occasions, MRIs and also ultrasounds. And of course, CT scans uh, for patients who have renal impairment has to be done with caution. And uh, it's done for about six monthly for two years. And if the lesion is stable, then uh, annually thereafter. Uh, sometimes they are required to have biopsies done, especially when there's a, a doubt in what the pathology is. Uh, in that case, we should do a biopsy. Or if a patient wants to go for some other modalities like an RFA or a cryosurgery. And if the patient progresses, we give them an individualized plan to uh, do definitive procedure uh, depending on how they want. So. One of the treatment for uh, tumors that are four centimeters or less uh, is a partial nephrectomy, as we spoke about. So what is a partial nephrectomy? Basically, it is removing of just the tumor mass, just the tumor tissue, and preserving the kidney. So it's also called a nephron sparing operation or a renal preserving operation. So literally in the animation, as exactly what it showed, we're just going to remove the mass. But prior to that, uh, to avoid bleeding, uh, the tumor is actually the renal artery is actually clamped. And then we shall discuss about how long it can be clamped and why we, it's clamped. It's clamped basically to avoid bleeding when the tumor is removed. And this is a safe uh, technique that has been used for many years now, and it can be done. Uh, robotically, laparoscopically, or with an open procedure. As is after the tumor is removed, there's uh, something called uh, renal raffi, where sutures are actually placed to bring the um, defect together so that the bleeding stops. So what is early unclamping and why do we need to clamp? So basically, uh, the clamp is actually placed for uh, uh, preventing the blood loss. So before someone, when, when someone provides a clamp or before it's clamped, we, uh, before it's cooled, we call it warm ischemic time. And after we put ice sludge as shown here, it's called cold ischemic time. So studies have shown by Nguyen showed that uh, there's similar sort of benefits for the EGFR if you clamp for between 13 minutes or 31 minutes. So thereabouts is what we actually use as a guide. There are many studies that show how safe warm ischemia time is uh, obtained or produced. Uh, and uh, Mahesh Desai said 30 minutes in his uh, BJOI paper with 179 patients with no drop in EGFR. Uh, Gaudi said uh, between uh, 40 minutes uh, or there, thereabouts, with uh, a mean drop of uh, EGFR of 19% versus eight. And Thompson uh, reported uh, 25 minutes. And after every minute, there was a 5% risk of uh, acute renal failure. And these days, we usually take about 30 minutes or so for safe warm ischemic time. Now, there's also segmental artery clamping, which is a very selective uh, artery clamping because we have 3D uh, models and images these days after a beautiful CT uh, scan. And we can selectively target uh, the segmental artery that is supplying the tumor to be clamped. Now, um, Indabi Singh from his paper uh, in the US said that uh, anatomical reconstruction can be done uh, using the CT scan. And this is actually uh, very helpful in clamping a segmental vessel and control intraoperative hypotension can be, do, uh, can be done to prevent uh, bleeding uh, during the deep dissection. And you can actually have, uh, with the aid of uh, micro dissectors, uh, the feeding vessels can be ligated and therefore there's very little damage to the rest of the kidney. So um, no clamp is not suitable for everyone. We know that uh, if it's an exophytic means, if it's a tumor that is actually bulging or it's actually majority of the tumor is outside or uh, protruding out of the kidney, then it is suitable. And sometimes when you want to clamp for uh, or provide a warm ischemic time of more than 30 minutes from the prognostication, then maybe uh, no clamp technique uh, can be used.
Okay, so uh, I think we'll take a short break uh, now, if it's okay, uh, to answer some questions before we move on to the locally advanced and metastatic disease. Uh, I have a few questions for the in the poll that uh, I'd like uh, to share with you to answer. I'll probably shop, stop share and we'll go to the polls in a short while. If that's okay, Dr. Murali, I'm just going to uh, project a couple of questions for them to uh, answer. Okay, so let's let's move on with the first question in the uh, right. So we we didn't interestingly we didn't uh, speak much about uh, the risk factors of RCC because I thought I'll tackle it during the poll itself. Uh, so the below are the risk factors for RCC. Could you just choose which are the best answer uh, for the risk factors that you know? So I'll just give you a few more seconds to finish that, please. probably another five, 10 more seconds, then uh, we'll, we'll just uh, conclude. Right, I'm just gonna end poll and share the results with you. Right, uh, so 7% said hypertension, 7% uh, said obesity, uh, another 7%, 14% said smoking. Uh, these are all risk factors. Uh, but the answer is actually all of the above. Interestingly, these are all uh, very strong risk factors for um, the RCC development. And there are other, many other risk factors as well uh, that include diabetes, mellitus, surprisingly, and also um, uh, uh, medication like acetaminophen. Uh, the protective uh, risk factors uh, include alcohol consumption, uh, among other, other things. So yeah, just sharing the results with you all. And we'll move on to one more question before we, uh, we move on to the second part of the lecture. Okay, so the, there is uh, something called a classic triad for uh, renal cell cancers, okay? So uh, this, this triad is actually uh, flank pain, hematuria, and a palpable abdominal renal mass. So this is the triad that is uh, read in textbooks and we all know. Would you choose, um, what do you think is the incidence of this uh, triad that occurs uh, in real time in patients that we see? Just wait for a few more seconds. Okay, so just to share the results, uh, interestingly, um, thirteen percent said. 5 to 10%, uh, most said um, 30 to 40% that you'll see the triad. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the answer is actually uh, 5 to 10%. So it's very surprising that the classic triad uh, is not really how people feature. Uh, these days, a lot of uh, cancers are actually picked up uh, incidentally, and um, we don't really see this uh, classic triad uh, presenting. So that's quite interesting. So we'll do one more question probably uh, prior, before we uh, uh, move on to the next one. So this question is, uh, so there is a maximum safe uh, warm ischemic time. I think we dealt about this uh, during the lecture and uh, it, it prevents uh, renal. So it's clamping the renal artery when we're doing uh, the partial nephrectomy. 
Uh, so where, how long can you actually clamp a renal artery without causing a significant drop in EGFR? Uh, just a good way to gauge uh, because I think we just spoke about it a little while ago. So I'll end poll and I think most of you got the answer correct. Uh, it is uh, roughly 30 minutes, uh, which is uh, probably the maximum time that we can clamp uh, the renal artery uh, for warm ischemic time. That's uh, very good. So um, we'll just move on uh, with the next half. Uh, are there any uh, housekeeping um, announcements? Dr. Murali, uh, would you like me to just proceed on with the next half of the lecture? I think you can, uh, Doctor. I don't see uh, too many questions at this point in time. So I think we can, we can just go ahead. Wonderful. So we're just going to segue into the advanced disease and then we're going to talk a little bit about what's new um, novel agents that we use and also a little bit on the future perspectives. So um, locally advanced disease um, actually means uh, T3 and T4 disease. So T3 disease basically is um, something beyond the kidney. So what happens is normally uh, tumor thrombus would form um, outside or in the renal vein. And Novik actually described the staging for these uh, levels of tumor thrombus. And the tumor thrombus found in the renal vein extending uh, to about two centimeters or less uh, into the IVC is at level one. And uh, then you see level two, which is uh, infrahepatic. Uh, so it's just below the hepatic uh, veins. And in level three, it is intrahepatic. Uh, so it's actually gone to the level of the intrahepatic IVC. And at level four, the thrombus is above the diaphragm. So it's actually extended into the right atrium. So most of the time it's already above the diaphragm and extending into the right atrium. And we do see some of these cases uh, in about actually 20, 30%. Sometimes you see a very advanced uh, renal cancer presenting like this. As this is a very good algorithm, actually, uh, that uh, we have, we follow, uh, where the surgical planning uh, is done actually according to where the tumor is and depending on the level of the thrombus. So uh, where we need a multidisciplinary team uh, approach to deal with these patients, we get a, have a meeting and then we discuss with the vascular or hepatobiliary or the cardiothoracic team on how we're gonna go about dealing with the tumor thrombus. Because most of the time we'll have to open the cava and sometimes the right atrium. So surgical management uh, we discussed um, a little while ago basically uh, involves um, a few things. And upon entering the peritoneum, actually, you just mobilize the bowel. The kidney is mobilized outside the gerotus fascia, of course, the ureter, you ligate, and then the renal hilum is exposed. The renal artery uh, is ligated, then comes the vein. A clamp, uh, we call it the Sedinsky clamp, uh, is applied uh, to the proximal IVC. The thrombus can be milked out if it's just uh, intrahepatic or in the uh, IVC and also suture, uh, sutures placed, uh, 304 proline sutures, and always have a supra or infra or contralateral renal control uh, before the ligation. That's very, very important that you have to control the vein on the other side as well. Uh, if there's a lumbar vein uh, or an accessory vein, all that has to be controlled. The surgical approach should be individualized uh, to the level of the tumor thrombus, and also uh, depends on the location and um, the anatomy uh, is also important. The approaches we spoke about are similar to what we spoke about during nephrectomies as well. We can do a flank, subcostal, a thoracic abdominal um, uh, approach, depending on where the tumor is. So uh, at level two, uh, we know that uh, the control of uh, the uh, vein uh, is done uh, as we mentioned before, and we clamp uh, when we have all the control of the contralateral vein and all the other veins, and uh, so to maintain the hemodynamic stability. Uh, this is just a picture to show you what a uh, chevron uh, incision looks like. And uh, this, upon entering, uh, we place all the retractors to expose the IVC, which is uh, shown here. That's the IVC on the third picture. 
and the renal vein over here. So in the fourth picture, you see the IVC uh, beautifully uh, and uh, how the control is uh, over the hepatic veins and also the contralateral uh, renal vein just before we do the thrombectomy. Um, another picture that we have uh, to show, uh, this is a bivalve specimen of the renal um, cancer or the, the kidney itself and uh, a ligated um, a renal artery and a renal vein. So the level three thrombus, uh, as we mentioned, uh, it's infrahepatic already. And uh, so we need a proper control where we have uh, uh, the, the extension can be uh, a, 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 a stenotomy or a chevron incision, which goes uh, slightly higher up. And this um, actually has uh, a benefit where the exposure is very good to the IVC. And we need to uh, have probably a hepatobiliary uh, colleague to actually mobilize the liver and to, because the bare area of the liver needs to be divided, the falciform ligament needs to be divided so that the liver can be actually be rotated quite easily uh, to gain control to the suprahepatic IVC before we get the thrombus uh, removed. Sometimes um, there's a patient needs to be on a cardiopulmonary bypass. And this is done uh, most of the times when the tumor thrombus involves the right atrium. Uh, not everyone gets a, a cardiopulmonary bypass uh, because uh, sometimes uh, they can actually get away uh, without uh, doing a bypass as well uh, or cardio, uh, cardioplegia. So sometimes when you see there's no oncological uh, process that outcomes that are observed when you do a cardiopulmonary bypass versus a deep hypothermic circulatory arrest or a partial bypass under normothermia or a single cable clamp without circulatory support. No surgical method was shown to be superior when you're excising a venous uh, thrombus uh, done with these two uh, types of uh, modalities. So uh, IVC filters and also bypass procedures remain uncertain and sometimes we, uh, a discussion and perioperative or an intraoperative uh, uh, assessment needs to be done closely before uh, it is embarked on. This is just a picture to show that uh, a huge defect uh, uh, in an open IVC. And this is how the IVC or the inferior vena cava looks uh, after it's open to remove the thrombus. And this of course will be closed using a proline suture later on. So the next, um, we move on to talk about uh, systemic therapy in advanced disease. And systemic therapy is actually quite a unique uh, genetic. So, so the unique genetic abnormalities uh, subtypes. There are a few subtypes like the CAIX um, tumor associated with um, antigen has the most uh, important specificity expressed and almost ubiquitously by the clear cell RCC. The expression in normal renal epithelium is suppressed by the wild type, wild type of the VHL gene that we mentioned, the protein, and it is a diagnostic and prognostic marker for RCC especially something like the B7 expressed on various immune and non-immune cells. So these are all the different ways of how we can uh, potentiate anti-tumor response. Um, and we, we have seen that has evolved over the years. So the first thing that actually came about was the interleukin-2, uh, which was approved for the treatment of uh, RCC. Interleukin-2 is an immunomodulator. And the overall response was pretty good in advanced disease between 7 and 27%. It was durable and complete response and only beneficial for uh, clear cell uh, type uh, RCC. And complete metastatic progression or regression was 7 to 9% in high dose interleukin 2. So more than 60% in this group showed uh, no dis disease uh, recurrence uh, during their follow up. Then came the alpha interferon or interferon alpha, also an immunomodulator, uh, had good, uh, it worked well as a, uh, as a monotherapy between 6 and 15% response with a tumor progression uh, reduction of about 25%. Uh, so when we risk stratify this patient into an intermediate risk group, it was really not beneficial and uh, durable complete response was only 2%. So uh, the model for new therapies, or you could call it the targeted therapies as shown here, basically involves the VEGF. 
So this is um, the vascular endothelial growth factor where this is uh, where the blood uh, uh, angiogenesis actually occurs. It is the most important growth factor that is involved in tumor angiogenesis. And it plays a significant role in the growth and the progression of many types of human cancer that includes the RCC. And uh, it elucidation of the downstream pathways from the VEGF receptor of VGFR has defined the number of targets for interruption of the signaling that results in the angiogenesis. So there are many pathways here, and there are various drugs now that can target these pathways in order for it not to actually progress. Tyrosine kinase, for example, is an enzyme that transfers uh, a phosphate group from, it, from the ATP uh, to a protein of the cell. So when you have uh, ATP transferred, that means uh, you're actually providing energy for the uh, cancer cells to progress. So, uh, so inhibitors of tyrosine kinase will actually help reduce the proliferation of this mutated protein kinases or the cancer cells. So that's what uh, people uh, are using now to target uh, cancer. So uh, an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor is um, sunitinib. Sunitinib uh, is uh, a VEGF as well as a tyrosine kinase associated receptor oncogene. And it actually blocks a lot of these angiogenetic uh, factors and anti it's like an anti-tumor drug. And first line treatment usually was given for many, many years. And there was some uh, progression free survival that was uh, significant compared to the interferon alpha. It showed 11 months compared to five months with interferon alpha. And it also had a better overall survival. Um, and the, of course, every of these drugs uh, do have their side effects and heart failure. Severe hypertension and hypothyroidism was its uh, side effect. Uh, another drug, uh, also an oral angiogenesis inhibitor with the action on uh, the VEGF uh, 1, 2, 3 uh, is pazopanib. Uh, pazopanib versus a placebo versus uh, a cytokine treated patients. It showed some improvement in the survival and the response. So all these drugs uh, had some response in months that um, showed uh, a benefit. And, but, but the problem with all these drugs are the side effects. Uh, the cyprotose toxicity was noted here. Adverse effects like fatigue, diarrhea, hypertension uh, were also seen. Axitinib uh, is a more selective uh, inhibitor of the uh, uh, VEGF, one, two, three. And uh, basically, it's an oral TKI that can be used as a monotherapy in combination for the advanced um, group. And also, uh, this, uh, a study by Rini compared uh, the effectiveness of exitinib versus sorafenib in advanced um, RCC. It was written up in Lancet. And also, uh, there was some uh, increase in survival in uh, these patients uh, for uh, many months, actually. So there was a um, higher dose of uh, adverse uh, effects of exitinib showed more toxicity, so it had to be monitored. The abnormal abnormalities to the VHL gene at 3P are usually seen in clear cell RCCs. And an abnormal or mutated VHL gene leads to a non-functioning or reduced VHL protein. VHL protein, amongst other duties, normally degrades the HIF alpha. So the HIF alpha is what you see here. Humor uh, is, is what you see here. And the HIF actually is a hypoxia-induced uh, factor. And it later becomes a substance that releases the hypoxia, hypoxic cell conditions. Uh, therefore, with the less uh, VHL protein, we have more cellular HIF alpha, and that is uh, not good news because it stimulates the angiogenesis and also the other glucose transport, autocrine, paracrine uh, transmission, which is uh, the cascade uh, of uh, trouble. So what next? After a decade of, uh, of dominance uh, of targeted therapies, the first limitation of the treatment mode uh, basically appeared because there was some resistance that we saw and also there were uh, also price uh, problems uh, because the drugs were very expensive and the side effects were unbearable. So these were the three issues that we uh, had to deal with. Furthermore, there was also an understanding of underlying mechanisms of T-cell response specifically detected against the RCC types. So 
with, with that uh, emerged more targeted uh, things like a checkpoint inhibitor. A checkpoint inhibitor, of course, is a type of immunotherapy. And uh, this checkpoint uh, are partner proteins. They bind together. They send an off and on signal to the T cell. They, when they bind with the tumor cell, they send an off signal. And that is actually not good because you want to make sure you fight the tumor cell and you want to turn it on. So with an inhibitor of this, we can actually use to destroy the cancer cell. So a lack of stimulation is not good. So we need to find a way to inhibit this. When an APC blocks the natural immune system of the T cell, it is actually term, termed a tolerogenic. So you should not have anything that is tolerogenic. You should actually have something that fights uh, for avoiding cancer. Now, coming to a very important slide on prognostic risk groups. Prognostic risk groups for cancers, uh, metastatic cancers are very important. We have uh, three um, ways we can prognosticate them into the favorable risk group, intermediate risk group, and the poor risk group, uh, basically with these criteria. Uh, it's uh, worthy of actually mention that uh, and take some time to know that uh, the performance score, the time from diagnosis, which is less than one year, a low hemoglobin, a high calcium, platelets and neutrophils are very impo important prognostic factors in determining who is poor and who is intermediate risk. You can see this slide here that uh, if uh, the cancer is detected after the 12th month, it's a tremendous um, uh, risk for the patient in that the overall survival dips uh, 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 tremendously. So the next um, few slides are basically to show how targeted treatment uh, like nivolumab and ipilimumab, uh, monoclonal antibodies have come into the picture. They, have, uh, they, they, they target the pdl one ligand inhibitors and how they are beneficial compared to uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So a combination drug actually here uh, improves the survival uh, for uh, intermediate and poor risk group for almost uh, double that of uh, sunitinib, which is a TKI. Similarly, in the keynote study, a combination of Pembro, Zilumab, and Exitinib uh, versus just a sunitinib actually has tremendous uh, benefit uh, uh, in overall survival as well. These are more seen in the intermediate and poor risk groups. Uh, for example, nivolumab and cabozantinib, when they are paired together, they actually show a survival benefit of many, many months compared to that uh, which just shown by Sunitini. So uh, the four studies uh, we mentioned, uh, basically when they put everything together here, they said that the cross trial uh, in response uh, was better. So all these studies showed that the better response of this targeted therapy when in combination, and also the rate to progression was actually limited. So that's, uh, that's a good thing. Over, uh, over two to three years, the rate of progression was limited. Um, we mentioned this earlier, that uh, combination drug is a better uh, uh, tolerated and also better thing for the overall survival. Uh, but uh, we have to watch out for adverse events. Uh, similarly, uh, another VEGF uh, combination and... Uh, uh, metastatic uh, disease with uh, phase three trials. And interestingly, uh, this is also part of the network of NCCN now that uh, if you have an unresectable disease, you can actually consider uh, giving them a systemic therapy uh, for treatment if you don't want to do a cytoreductive nephrectomy. So what are the future perspectives? I think uh, it is important that uh, we do uh, note that germline genetic testing would become very much cheaper in the future. And uh, I think every, it's going to be more affordable and everyone will actually uh, benefit by doing germline testing because there is a strong preponderance of uh, renal cancers with uh, uh, genetic mutations. And we find this out, it's actually going to be better to treat and easier to screen. And uh, there's also uh, contrast-enhanced ultrasound. Uh, that's got an, some added value in the si significant um, uh, masses that we detect. Uh, it is excellent for uh, cystic renal masses to tell you bit, uh, when a cystic renal mass has uh, got pre uh, the preponderance to having a cancer or a solid lesion within. Uh, it's actually more sensitive than some of the imaging modalities out there. And I think it's going to have a better 
a more bigger role to play in the future, especially when one has uh, abnormal renal function. So decision uh, to be made uh, should be made wisely, uh, whether to do a cytoreductive means uh, to remove the kidney when the patient already has an advanced disease with a primary MET. Yes, of course, when the MET is uh, an oligometastatic disease, uh, we can just do a cytoreductive nephrectomy, uh, maybe a metastatectomy with that as well. However, when the there is metastasis is extensive, uh, probably uh, erring and using systemic therapy should be better. So uh, this is a, a fantastic uh, uh, table to show the impact of targeted treatment over the years. Uh, this occurred in just six years. Uh, and this uh, study basically showed in America that uh, how cytoreductive nephrectomy has actually just diminished over time. Uh, and immunotherapy has also gone, uh, uh, was not in vogue. However, targeted treatment now is the mainstay, uh, the main player and the game changer in certain countries. These are some of the uh, studies that are uh, in the process at the moment and you're going through um, there are different phases of testing and uh, also when the completion dates are and both all of them compare uh, combination therapy versus uh, monotherapy in targeted treatment and some even have cytoreductive nephrectomy as a uh, uh, modality and arm and uh, this uh, use of uh, RT or radiotherapy along with uh, the uh, or in an arm for patients with advanced disease. And it'll be nice to see what the results are like. Um, utilizing uh, systemic therapy is very important because uh, some cytoreductive nephrectomy patients require systemic therapy after the operation, but if they don't have the access, we should be very, very careful in order to do uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy because one of the studies actually showed that some tumors can actually rapidly progress after an operation and uh, the mortality rate is quite high. So uh, selective uh, choosing and basically uh, a treatment for these patients are very important. Uh, this is just to highlight what I said before on prognostic models, uh, the IMDC or the Hinks model, extremely important in order to prognosticate uh, how patients would benefit uh, from uh, systemic therapy and further therapy like uh, cytoreductive nephrectomy. So uh, that uh, comes to the end. Uh, I would like to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, the optimal management for a solid uh, renal parenchymal mass basically relies upon the ability of imaging studies and the likelihood of the lesion to exhibit clinical malignant behavior. Active surveillance, uh, ablative therapy, and partial nephrectomy are accepted management outcome uh, protocols in uh, solid renal mass or small renal masses the prognostic models are extremely useful tools to assess modality uh, of treatment. And uh, in primary metastatic RCCs, uh, it's very heterogeneous. Uh, so the selection of patients and treatment is key. Systemic therapy is now uh, becoming the mainstay of therapy for majority of the patients. And um, between 25 and 30% of the intermediate risk patients would uh, live longer than two years. So that's something to keep in mind to provide a good quality of life and poor prognosis are best treated with targeted agents. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Doctor. That was uh, really uh, refreshing. And I think uh, for a lot of us, I think it's uh, critical that uh, you're sharing today about renal cancer is a, is a cancer that perhaps we don't see all that often. Um, and that may be really because we, we're not looking for it. Uh, so uh, in the right places. Uh, so one, one of the questions I think we had, I think we have a couple of questions, Doctor, including uh, I think one of our colleagues uh, has got quite an interesting uh, question to ask you. But uh, my, my own kind of uh, question which is coming is from, from many of us who are kind of in either primary care or we're looking, uh, we're working in community medicine. So what are the kind of thoughts we should be thinking of that when, when it leads us to, you know, look at a, like, like a, something maybe suspicious of renal uh, cancer? Um, I think primarily what's important is uh, we know uh, from what I presented that 
those classical triads uh, that you looked at in textbooks last time, where you said there's a flank mass, um, a patient comes with a pain, and you know, those things are not really seen very much these days. Yeah, so uh, it's only five to ten percent. Now, uh, the things to look at uh, most of the times are when a patient is screened for health and they pick up a mass, renal mass. So that's incidentally picked up, and that's what people uh, most of the time gets uh, referred for. Uh, the other interesting thing is hematuria. So hematuria can be divided into gross and also uh, microscopic. And I think hematuria should never be taken lightly because most of the times they have to be investigated, especially when they occur uh, uh, more than once. Uh, when the patient has gross hematuria, although uh, they, everyone says in painless hematuria, 80% of the time it could be bladder related, but in the painful types and all that, you could have stones, but it can also be a renal cause. So I think that should be uh, something kept uh, in the armamentarium. So um, uh, there's always this um, other kind of uh, perspective on which, which a lot of patients have these days. And I think what you've done today, uh, Doc, is really to give us uh, kind of, not Oh, but I think but better understanding that surgery is still quite a significant way to kind of manage most cancers. Um, in terms of like, what is the kind of cutoff point, uh, Doc? How do we reach uh, surgical uh, kind of uh, expertise when it's pertaining to this? Um, if you see a mass, is it then um, good to refer on to a urologist to have a look at it? Should we, is there something that you'd like to see in addition before that patient comes to you? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And thank you for asking that because I, I think it's very important to uh, figure out where these patients are coming from and also um, the level of difficulty in order for them to get referred sometimes to a tertiary hospital. So I think it's very pertinent to know that um, renal tumors or renal masses uh, should be dealt with uh, quite as an emergent uh, or an urgent uh, sort of a referral. So by actually picking up the phone and giving a call to the hospital to find out uh, whether the patient can be seen earlier uh, is definitely something that we should do and not uh, sit on. Um, Often, often patients don't have access to tertiary hospitals and they actually get delayed in, in terms of referral. And I think uh, that can totally be avoided when someone just recognizes this. So I think it's also the knowledge attitude and also practices in order to gain uh, more sort of uh, urgency when it comes to, uh, picking, uh, to, to identifying these problems. Got it, Doctor. And um, I think uh, another question I think which a lot of people uh, may be asking is in terms of imaging, and I think we discussed, you covered a little bit of this uh, today as well, as a modality to kind of look at and maybe screen for uh, kind of renal masses uh, is, is an ultrasound etogram. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question as well. Uh, I, and uh, we know that an ultrasound always has a limitation in terms of um, uh, you know, uh, how much it can actually gauge. Now, um, as I mentioned, the CT scan, it's still the mainstay of, uh, or the best modality of imaging for a renal mass. However, uh, ultrasound uh, in, the, in good hands gets to pick up these renal masses before they can be imaged better. So uh, if uh, an ultrasound is all they have in the uh, a, a setting that is slightly rural, I would think um, getting an ultrasound to begin with is important. But when they come to the tertiary hospital, of course, they're going to be screened thoroughly. Well, doctor. There's a question on, um, on whether ke chemotherapy uh, is required for, ke for re RCC. Um, no, um, the answer is, uh, yeah, it's quite clear. Uh, there's no... Um, evidence that actually uh, there's any good response for the clear cell uh, to chemotherapy. Uh, most of the, most of the uh, drugs that we use are actually uh, immunotherapeutic drugs and uh, targeted treatment. So uh, I, I don't think there is actually um, much evidence for that. Okay, got it, got it, doctor. That's coming from viewer. There's another, I think one of our 
colleagues who ask, is sunitinib available uh, in government hospitals? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, sunitinib is available um, and uh, we refer our patients to Institute Cancer Nagara, which is the National Cancer Institute in Putrajaya. And uh, in Institute Cancer, sunitinib is still uh, one of the mainstay of treatment uh, for uh, advanced RCC, uh, especially the clear cell variant. And so, yes, it is available. Got it. Doctor, in terms of... Can I ask, can yes. I ask some questions? Uh, go ahead, Doctor. Uh, I'm Dr. Chan. I have two of my friends died of uh, kidney cancer and I was quite sad. So I went to read something about it from UCLA. And there are certain things which I like to bring up uh, to ask Dr. Harun. There were cases in UCLA where in a metastatic cancer, where they spread, but if you remove the uh, kidney, somehow some of them, the metastasis just resolve. How do you explain? That's the first question. And the other thing is, how do you explain interleukin-2, which is very, very toxic. In fact, it can cause kidney failure and lung failure. But it has in some cases caused durable, complete re remission. How do you explain that? Uh, the other Thanks. thing I don't want to Ask about uh, William Kalin, uh, uh, the Nobel Prize winner for this uh, EPO and uh, HIPE, HIF, uh, F. He has uh, sort of given the Nobel Prize with a potential uh, to produce a drug that could be of beneficial to uh, renal cancer. Can you sort of explain to me? on this call. Um, thank, thank you, Dr. Chan. Uh, I'm sorry for the loss of your friends. Uh, it's, thank you for the questions. Uh, the first one um, was basically something on cytoreductive nephrectomy. Uh, base, that is the basis on how they actually figured out that, uh, you see, not very many cancers, once it's already metastasized, can actually be removed. Normally, when you say it's a stage four cancer, it's already uh, spread to the other parts of the body. Surgery is not the mainstay of treatment, but renal cancer is a bit different. They say that tumor burden, uh, once it's uh, removed, uh, it can actually cause a little, uh, uh, some uh, regression of the other parts, and it's actually proven. So cytoreductive nephrectomy is reduction of the tumor burden, and that is actually proven uh, for uh, reduction in small uh, oligo or small metastasis, especially when they are one centimeter or less. That's the answer for the first question. The second one is uh, on alpha interferon, uh, if I'm not mistaken. No, interleukin-2. Okay. So inter interleukin-2, as you very rightfully said, uh, it is, uh, was since 1992, it was approved for renal cancers, and uh, it's an immune modulator. The uh, overall response uh, for this uh, immune modulator is about, 7 to 27 percent. And you must say that there is a durable com response compared to people who don't get it. It's true. But uh, everything is, uh, you know, dose dependent. And it also is, uh, you, you have to take into account the toxicity because one of the limiting factors is toxicity. Um, uh, there, there have been between uh, 7 and 10 percent of patients, I think, who have seen uh, uh, a high dose interleukin-2 uh, given to them and they have complete uh, metastatic regression. It has been reported and, um, and, and no disease recurrence for some of the patients of, of mo sometimes even more than 50% of the patients in a, in a, a given time. So uh, I think it has its benefits, but it has to be uh, basically weighed uh, uh, in, on a patient-to-patient -patient basis uh, and uh, how they are surveyed as well. Uh, the third question is uh, HIF, um, how uh, the Nobel laureate, uh, whether there's a medication for the HIF uh, targeted treatment. I think that's the way everyone is headed nowadays because the pathway uh, where the VEGFs and um, the HIFs are the ones that are uh, targeted is, is probably the way to go. Thank I hope you. I answered your question, Dr. Yeah. Chan. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Doc, let's take one one uh, more question and before we wind up the session. Is, it, if that, is, is that okay with you? Absolutely. Okay, lovely, Doc. There's a question from, I think, another colleague who, who asks, is there, is there a role for proton therapy in the management of renal carcinoma? How effective is that? Uh, did you say pro photon therapy? Uh, proton therapy. Um, sorry, it probably is an experimental uh, stage at the moment, but uh, I've not encountered any uh, patients uh, who have received any at the moment. However, uh, if I do gather some data, probably uh, in the next meeting, it could publish that, but uh, certainly not um, that I know of. Okay. Got, got it, doctor. Thank you so much. I think uh, this has been a, quite an interesting session. We've covered quite a bit. And as we bring the session to a close, uh, could I ask you to leave us, leave us with some uh, perhaps words of wisdom, something that we can take home? Uh, uh, I, I would first of all like to wish everyone a happy 2022. I think it's uh, we've all gone through a very uh, tough year. Uh, just like uh, 2020, we expected 2021 to be a better year, but uh, I think there are a lot of hardships that we had to encounter. Um, I think perseverance is the way to go, and I hope all of you uh, are in, always in good health and keep well. Now, uh, words of wisdom is uh, health is uh, wealth, really, and uh, I think we should all take care of our health. Uh, there's nothing more that we need to do. Uh, despite all the hardships that you face, if you're healthy, you can still strive and move on. Uh, cancer detection, yes, it's important. Uh, once you're more than 50, uh, please start uh, doing some screening for your cancers. Um, and uh, well, uh, if, if you do have any uh, renal cancers or uh, family, friends uh, with renal cancers that you uh, would like to refer or get an opinion, uh, you might uh, be able to send them to Serdang Hospital. i uh, be more than happy to help. Thank you. Right, Doctor. Um, thank you very much uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen. That, that was Dr. Arun Arunachalam, um, urologist, consultant urologist at Hospital Serdang with the Ministry of Health Malaysia. And with that, we're bringing this session and perhaps this entire year of, of SK Dharma Lingam. Uh, series to a close. Wishing you all a very happy new year and uh, we'll, we'll see you all next year. And this platform, I think, will be migrating this uh, series to Dockity. Um, so uh, we'll see you on Dockity um, and, and we very, we'll be very excited to see you there. Um, so um, for those, I, I think Dr. Aaron and myself will be signing off. Uh, and my colleague is going to put on the QR code for you to, to kind of scan for your CME points. Uh, so we'll just do that and then they'll be on for a bit. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and good night. We'll see you. Thank you, Dr. Aaron. Good night.